So, this is our science and technology section, and uh, I think you'll be really interested in this next uh, speaker. Um, because it, it's, it's quite technical, I'm, I'm going to read to make sure I make no mistakes. The, the scientists at Emotive, the company is called Emotive, appear to have done the impossible, which is to create a brain wave reading headsets that lets you conjure up entire worlds using nothing but your brain, and then control elements in these worlds. Uh, really a, a breakthrough worth, I guess, billions of dollars if it's actually real and practical. Uh, this is thought conversion technology and is composed of some extremely sophisticated software and a piece of headgear that looks like a cross between a telephone headset and a skeletal bike helmet. I think we'll see a picture of it when we see a picture of the co-founder and CEO of this company, Tan Le. Um, I think the primary first use of this device will probably be in the video game world, uh, but you can immediately imagine what all the other extraordinary applications might be, and I believe that Tan Lee has some very utopian and forward-thinking ideas about the potential of her device. Absolutely. Welcome to you. Thank you, Moses. So I'm often asked, you know, what was it that got me involved with Emotive? I mean, why did I start this company that does a brain-computer interface device? And my, often my answer is, well, if you've watched Star Wars, who wouldn't want to have the experience of the Force firsthand? And, I mean, when I was a little girl, um, I remember sitting at the breakfast table willing my empty cereal bowl into the dishwasher so <laughs> it would just magically disappear. Um, but my story um, really began way before that um, because with the motive, um, there are, you really do have to get out of your comfort zone and you have to be very comfortable with starting from absolutely nothing because there's no precedent for what we've done before. So um, the story really starts um, at the end of, a few years after the end of the Vietnam War. Um, it was a very difficult time, particularly for families who either were politically um, related in some way to the former government or who had wealth. And my family had both. And for that reason, we were very often persecuted by, by the government at the time. So when my, as my grandfather was lying um, in his bed before he passed away, he said to my mother, take your two daughters out of this country and start a new life. Give them a chance for the future. And, um, and so with that, my family started preparations to leave the country. And, uh, you know, it was not an easy process. We were lucky, we did have wealth, and so we were able to purchase an American tugboat that would then later on take 161 people out of the country. Um, but, you know, it was a very difficult uh, journey for us. Um, my mother was only in her early 20s at the time, taking her two young daughters, um, leaving behind really everything that she knew, uh, everything um, that was known and familiar, leaving behind family, friends, um, history and roots, and really going out into an open sea knowing not what we would find, not knowing really where we would go, only knowing that we wanted to flee um, the country of our birth. So it was a very difficult decision, but one that she made uh, because she had hope. She believed in, and had hope in the future and believed that if we could start over again, we would have a fresh start and have a, a chance for a really good future. So um, we were really the, one of the very lucky few. I mean, it's, it's unknown how many people, how many millions of, of people at that time uh, perished at sea at the hands of pirates or because of the difficult monsoon weather that we all ventured out to sea. Um, during, it was often that we, we ventured out during the monsoon season so that there would be less officials guarding the, the coastline. Uh, but we were very lucky. Um, after five days and nights at sea, my, um, I can remember very clearly sitting next to my mother on the deck of the boat and looking out at the sky and singing, oh my goodness, all these beautiful stars in the sky that were so close up to us. Um, and what we realized after about 
30 seconds or so, a couple minutes, everybody started screaming, oh my goodness, we found people um, right in the middle of the ocean. And you can imagine five nights, five days and nights at sea without seeing anybody with very, very difficult weather conditions, being chased by pirates twice, and then finally seeing some, some people. And uh, this was a British oil tanker who um, kindly led us on board, took us in as refuge, um, at, g gave us refuge, and then took us into Malaysia, where we um, stayed for three months in a refugee camp amongst rats the size of cats um, who would <laughs> really try to bite us at night time. But after three months in the refugee camp, we were very lucky and we were accepted into Australia as refugees. And uh, I can very clearly remember the walking down the gangway from the aeroplane and my mother held my younger sister and I in her two hands and then she, she basically said to us, when you, at the bottom of the steps, you will reach onto very special ground and you should bend down and touch the ground. And I remember bending down, touching the ground, and looking up and saying to my mum, Mum, it doesn't feel very special. <laughs> and so she said, then make it special in your minds. And this is the, the opportunity that we realised that we had had. We had the chance to really start all over again and begin a new life. Um, and obviously, life in Australia wasn't all that simple for my mother. We didn't have any... Like, um, money except for the clothes we were wearing at the time. We didn't really have a, a, a friend, many friends and we, um, we didn't have the language which was, was a very significant barrier. So my mother started out, uh, she was a great inspiration to me uh, throughout my life um, and she has, uh, she continues to be. She started out working on a farm picking vegetables, she then got a job at a, a factory inspecting motor vehicle, um, Holden vehicles and then all the time studying English, and finally um, had, uh, took two university degrees, started a master's course, entered local government, and became elected as the first, very first Vietnamese female mayor to be elected into local government anywhere in the world outside of Vietnam. <laughs> Thank you. So, really an incredible person um, that I drew a lot of inspiration from. But one thing my mother really taught me was, the second thing, well, the first thing was obviously being able to be comfortable with getting outside your comfort zone and starting from scratch. At any point in your life, it's okay to start all over again. The second thing that I learned from my mother is that opportunities are often challenges in disguise for people like us because, you know, it wasn't going to be served on a silver platter for us. We didn't have the connections, we didn't have all of the opportunities presented to us. But when there was a challenge, that was an opportunity for us to grab that and to overcome those and then from there, opportunities would flourish. And uh, this is, I, I, I excelled quite well at school. I um, started university at 16, completed a law degree, um, entered the, the legal profession and then started my first business, sold that when I was 26, and then started Emotive. So that was a very quick potted history of what I've done. Um, but really, why am I fascinated by, by the human brain? I mean, this is an area that's always been something that we've been so fascinated about uh, for so long. And, you know, the brain is made up of billions of active neurons. When these neurons interact, the chemical reaction emits an electrical impulse, which can be measured. So, now since the 1920s, when Hans Berger first was able to study human EEG, which is the process for observing changes in electrical fluctuations at the surface of the scalp, um, which is resulting from neurons firing inside the brain. We have always dreamed and imagined of a time when it might be possible to control and influence our environment simply with our brain. And this was an area that captivated and inspired um, our team. Uh, we were really fascinated by the possibility of introducing total communication to computing platforms, applications and devices. Because up until now, our communication with machines has always been very limited to conscious and direct forms. Whether it's something simple like turning on the lights with a switch, or even as complex as programming robotics, we have always had to give a command to a machine, or even a series of commands to a machine, for it to do something for us. 
Communication between people, on the other hand, is so much more interesting and far more complex because we take into account so much more than what is explicitly expressed. You know, we observe facial expressions, we observe body language, and from that we can intuit feelings and emotions into our dialogue with one another. Um, and so this was something that we really wanted to be able to do, which was to give the chance for people to, uh, to allow machines to actually introduce this, this whole layer of human communication into the human-computer interaction, so that computers not only understand what you direct it to do, but it can also understand and observe your facial ex uh, expressions and respond to your, your actual emotional experiences. A lot of people who haven't had the opportunity to try the device often asks me, you know, so what is it like? I mean, how do I get good at this? And I think this is a pretty good, exa um, pretty good explanation of what you do. It's actually very true. And children, we found, is really good at this because they don't have any inhibitions, they don't have any um, expectations of what it is going to be like. So what we have we been able to do with this technology so far? Um, obviously, the, as, as Moses mentioned, there are numerous applications for this technology. We're able to now detect facial expressions reliably, uh, emotional experiences, and also your cognitive intent. Uh, and I'll, give you, I'll show you some examples of what we're able to do uh, today. So, for example, being able to mirror um, your facial expression so that an avatar can very naturally express um, without you having to learn anything. You know, if you want to smile, you can just simply smile. If you want to flirt at someone, you know, wink and, and, and smile. It's very straightforward. No need to, to learn a combination of buttons. An another example is being able to control and influence the environment with your emotional experience. And we had a lot of artists um, and, and creative expressions uh, linked to the emotional experience. So when you're calm, when you're feeling uh, calm, the colors of the sky can be very mellow and, and relaxed, and then when you're feeling excited and exuberant, uh, the colour of the sky can, can change accordingly. Obviously, a really um, easy to understand example is this, what I'm talking about, which is the force. Being able to manipulate um, an object, a virtual ob object in this case, simply by thinking about it. So in that example, he was able to lift the rock just by thinking lift, and similarly repair the bridge simply by thinking um, lift to repair the bridge. Here's another example of something I always wanted to do when I was little, which is move and bend a spoon with my mind. So that was an example of the Discovery Channel uh, implementing, uh, and you'll see some more work from, from them as well. And here's another one of uh, being able to use the headset, which you see on, on his head there, to basically connect it to a toy and, uh, and lift up the toy. I'm just going through a number of examples because, you know, as a, uh, as a company, we've created the technology platform to allow application developers, researchers to take our technology from where it is today into, and extend it to a whole range of other applications and domains that, um, that we can't focus on uh, as a company. So here's another one of an implementation uh, of the headset being used to control a, a toy robot. So here you can see that the, the cube is, is, move, is there you go, it's being pulled forward and now it will basically move the, the robot backwards. And then when the person actually thinks forward, which is, you can see the cube moving back into the distance there, the robot starts to to move forward. Here's a really interesting example. This is the same team that did the Discovery Channel. A lot of people, when I come and talk about this and I show my technology, they say, what else can you do? Can you drive a car with it? Well, it's a bit wild and fanciful, but this team at the Discovery Channel actually linked it up to a demolition derby where they were able to control, start the car, and then drive the car simply with their minds. Um, and that was pretty crazy. And we also saw um, recently the BBC did a similar thing with London taxis as well, basically being able to um, initiate the engine and then basically use fairly simple commands to, to drive um, the vehicle.
Um, this is something I really like from a team at Dartmouth University. Focus on the contact and you're ready to go. It's basically the guy is wearing a headset and uh, using a P300 signal, which is a recognition um, in your brain, to basically, whenever a, a, an image of someone you want to dial flashes up, that person immediately is, is called, so you don't actually have to type in any numbers anymore. <laughs> Pretty wild and fanciful, but it was an interesting example. And then um, here's another one of a smart home implementation. So in this case, um, this young man is able to control the blinds, uh, closing of the blinds, and then uh, in his home, and then later on, uh, once the blinds are closed, he'll be able to turn on the lights by thinking about turning on the lights. And then turning off the lights. And finally, this is something that I'm most excited about. Um, Here's a, a real life-changing application that, um, that we've seen uh, in terms of the use of the headset to really that allow right people... To go right. Control an electric like wheelchair left. with the headset. Turn back left. Now smile to go straight. <laughs> you know, so uh, this gives you a, a, a range of examples of what the technology can do. But, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're still only scratching the surface of what is possible today. And um, we're hoping that we can reach out to developers and researchers around the world, like the ones that you've seen on the screen tonight, t today, to really help to shape where this technology t can go from here. So thank you so much. Oh no, I'll give <laughs> Thank you. Did, did you bring one of these devices with you? I, I did, but I, I don't have it on stage with me actually. No. Well, at the party, can you bring it around? I certainly can bring it around. Yeah. Uh, two, two things come to mind. Uh, a number of years ago when I was visiting the uh, media lab at MIT, uh, I saw a little video of a quadriplegic who had a device that appeared to be half inside his skull and half out. Yes. which presumably was the transmitting device, right. and he was able to move a cursor on a screen. Uh, is this the same technology in the same family of technology? The, it's the same mentioned? family of, the te of technology. The only difference is that this technology is non-invasive. So you don't need to insert a metal probe into the brain. It's simply putting on a headset that you wear. It's measuring the changes in electrical fluctuations just at the surface of the scalp. The other good thing is generally with some of these technologies in the past, there's a very long training process. Um, in this case, uh, the training process can take as little as a few minutes, so really? it's super fast. So that same fellow could now take the benefit of your device without the operation required? That's correct. He probably the won't get the level of granularity that he would get from a brain implant, but certainly to be able to control simple um, activities that's been well defined in an application, that would certainly be possible. We have um, an, another one, another application where you can basically type um, just with your, your thoughts. So th there are certainly applications out and, there that's been shown to work. And are these research lab devices, or is this a practical device? No, that it's a practical and buy? device. It's available now, and it's it's uh, available for sale. Really? Yes. In North America? In North America, and we we do sell the developer devices all around the world. Under the Emotive brand. Under the Emotive brand. Have you thought of sending one to uh, um, Hawking, Stephen Hawking? So everybody mentions that. I don't know anybody who knows Stephen Hawkins. But oh, well, no, no. <laughs> he, he, he's actually spending, I think, six months at the Perimeter Institute just outside of Toronto here oh, as a, a guest scholar. Wonderful. Uh, if you leave us one of the devices, I'm pretty sure I can get it to him. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay.